Unfortunately, the infant in our narrative didn't have a say in her situation. Her short two-week existence seemed like a merciless jest. The tale we're about to share is perplexing and appalling and will no doubt leave you with several unanswered questions. This is the story of Kalia McNabb. Christopher Michael McNabb and Courtney Marie Bell, both 28-year-old first cousins, cohabited in a trailer in Covington, Georgia's Eagle Point Mobile Home Community, near Henderson Mill Road and Highway 36 in September 2017. Together, they were raising their two-year-old daughter, Clarissa. It's worth noting that they are indeed first cousins living together as a couple with a child, which may raise eyebrows for some. However, it is important to highlight that relationships or marriages between first cousins are not criminal offenses in Georgia. Actually, it's legally accepted in more regions than one might think. Born on March 29th, 1993, Courtney was brought up mainly by her father, Tim Bell, and her grandparents. She was estranged from her mother, not even knowing her identity until one day, at age 12, she stumbled upon a hospital bracelet in her father's car. The bracelet, listing her birth date and the name Pamela Hamby, revealed the truth about her mother. In the past, Pamela Hamby and Courtney had been presented to each other as family friends. However, at the age of 12, Courtney managed to put the pieces together and discovered that Pamela was her biological mother. As can be inferred, Pamela was far from being a nurturing mother, neglecting her responsibility to all seven of her children. Despite Courtney's efforts to forge a relationship with her, Pamela remained indifferent. Now, let's delve into the peculiarities of this situation. Why was a 12-year-old girl searching for cigarettes in her father's car? What explains the existence of Pamela's hospital bracelet in the car after 12 whole years? Has Tim ever bothered to clean his car? Finally, in 2013, Pamela made a move, arguably the worst, by introducing her 20-year-old daughter to her biological brother's son, Christopher McNabb. Interestingly, the two had a lot in common. Given their shared lineage, love of drugs, and upbringing without moms, it stands to reason that they would desire to form a relationship. I won't criticize their strange cousin relationship right now. I mean, to each his own. However, Christopher wasn't exactly a stand-up man either. He was referred to as the kid from hell because of his misbehavior, which began when he was just eight years old. So let's talk a little bit about Christopher while keeping that in mind. His birthday is March 23, 1990. He had already accrued a criminal record by the time he was 14 years old, involving fights, theft, property damage, and running away from home. Actually, Christopher was the victim of several police calls by his father and stepmother. Christopher would simply steal their belongings, so his parents had to place a deadbolt on their bedroom door to keep him out. Furthermore, it was not at all helpful. According to reports, he had taken around $7,000 in jewelry and about $300 in cash from his parents' bedroom, using the money to book hotel rooms for use. He was arrested at the age of 17 for crimes including auto theft, criminal damage to property, and criminal trespass. As you can see, Christopher repeatedly broke into Woods Fabrication, a metal shop in Taylorsville, Georgia, which is located at 2759 Old State Highway, 113. While he was there, he broke through a closed gate to steal a 2006 Ford F-350. You would think that Christopher wouldn't be foolish enough to hit the same spot twice. Almost two weeks later, however, he was back in jail after a security officer reported to the police that Christopher attempted to run him over as he was stealing a 1989 Ford vehicle and used it to smash through a fence. Roughly nine days after the first incident, local law enforcement found themselves back at the same fabrication shop. This time, they were there to investigate the theft of a 1964 Buick Skylark. Christopher had made another daring escape through the facility's gate using this vehicle. It is believed that he repeated this act a total of five times. Christopher's criminal spree continued with the theft of a PlayStation and another car, which he stole from a home where he was temporarily lodging. This led to another arrest, resulting in a two-year prison sentence. One might assume that this time in prison would have been a wake-up call for Christopher. However, a mere five weeks after being released, he stole his father's car. This started a high-speed chase with the police that concluded when he ran into a curb, causing the car tire to blow out. Deciding to abandon the car, he attempted to escape on foot. The police were able to find him around two in the morning, leading to another arrest. 
having introduced Christopher, let's proceed to the next chapter of this unique couple. Courtney and Christopher professed to be a married couple, although in truth they were not. The relationship was a source of considerable embarrassment for Chris's family, particularly drawing the ire of his father. Courtney suffered a pregnancy scare when her IUD supposedly slipped out, leading to the birth of their first daughter, Clarissa, in 2015. Courtney had previously experienced a loss due to a stillbirth from a different relationship. During Clarissa's initial year and a half, Christopher was absent and incarcerated again. Upon his release, he maintained that there was an immediate connection with his daughter. Initially, the three of them took up residence with Courtney's father, Tim Bell, but the growing need for space prompted a move to a trailer in Eagle Point, a community in Covington, Georgia. Far from being a warm, family-centered environment, this mobile home community was notorious for housing numerous offenders. Formerly known as Pine Valley Mobile Home Park, it was the site of a heinous crime on August 16, 2000. William David Riley Sr. was convicted of setting fire to his trailer with his children inside six-year-old Ashley, five-year-old William, and three-year-old Samantha, and was subsequently condemned to death on March 14, 2003. The police were well acquainted with Eagle Point owing to frequent domestic disturbance calls, some of which led them to the McNabb Bell residence. It came to light that Christopher had begun to physically abuse Courtney, leaving her marred with On one occasion, his anger manifested violently as he shattered the windows of their trailer. He needs some police down here because lot 31 is busting one inside the trailer. Who is busting the windows out? Uh, the people that read 31. Despite enduring complications, Courtney and Christopher decided to expand their family. Kalia Claire Noella McNabb was born prematurely on September 23, 2017 to Courtney. The infant had to stay in the hospital for four days due to her premature birth, which required antibiotic treatment and monitoring as she was just five pounds. After discharge, Kalia along with her sibling Clarissa, were left in the care of Courtney's cousin, Megan Sorrells. However, Courtney never returned to take her children back. As caring for her cousin's children in addition to her own became overwhelming, Tim Bell, Courtney's father, decided to step in and take the kids under his care. However, he had a hunch about Courtney's drug issue, which was affecting her ability to care for her children. An incident occurred on the very day involving a car that led Courtney to place a 911 call. Previously, Tim had purchased a PT Cruiser, which he allowed Courtney to use, covering about $600 in prepaid insurance. The car was later reclaimed by him and his parents, as Courtney seemingly abandoned her young ones. This move infuriated Christopher and led to Courtney and Tim making separate calls to law enforcement. Need County 911, what's the address of your emergency? Um, my dad and them came to my house. My dad and my grandparents came to my house. Um, they had my little girl in the car. I took my little girl. Um, they went to my cousin's house where my kids were. Um, and, uh, took my newborn that I just had. And they took my car. Why did they do that? I uh, said so that they were taking my kids. Newton County, now one more your emergency. Ms. Brown, can you tell the police out to my house at 65 Loudon Drive, Custody, Georgia, 30014? Yes, 65 Loudon Drive. What's going on there? Yes, yes ma'am. It's containing my grand grandchildren. Uh, she left both her kids. She, they abandoned both their kids last night at my niece's house. Uh, the police is going to come out. Yeah, yeah, they're coming out there to you. They're out there right now at Eagle Point talking to them, and they're okay. going to come over there and, and talk to you, okay? So okay. you'll just wait right there, okay? Okay, thank you, ma'am. Right, thank bye -bye. you, bye-bye. As the story goes, Tim returned Clarissa and Kalia to their parents, Courtney and Christopher, on the 6th of October after gaining assurance from her that she would clean her house. In his observation, Tim was satisfied that Kalia was in good health, well cared for, and clean, with no signs of injuries, when he left her with her parents. He also reported seeing Christopher concealing himself behind a tree upon his arrival, which could be owed to their reportedly strained relationship. However, it might have been in the kids' best interest to remain with their grandfather. Craig Weatherford, Courtney's cousin, paid the couple a visit that very night with the intention of joining them and taking Craig claims he observed Kalia during his visit 
and remarked that she appeared to be perfectly fine, peacefully sleeping in her bassinet in the bedroom. Courtney retreated to the living room couch to sleep around 5 a.m. On the 7th of October, after an evening spent mostly awake with Kalia, it is uncertain if Kalia actually kept crying throughout the night or if it was Courtney's induced restlessness from the previous evening that kept her awake. That very morning, at 5.51, Christopher was already awake and had updated his Facebook profile picture. Early in the morning at 7.41 a.m., Christopher sent a text message to his buddy, Shane Kidd, admitting that he's feeling paranoid and needed to escape from the house. Shane, who also took Christopher's trailer home, had always used it as a drug hideaway, even after Kalia was brought back from the hospital. In Shane's perspective, Christopher's state of wigging and tripping indicated his paranoia due to methamphetamine use. An hour after his initial text, Christopher texted Shane once more, expressing his inability to locate Kalia. It's worth mentioning that from 10.30 p.m. on October 6th until 9.42 a.m. On October 7th, amidst Christopher's frantic search for his baby, he was engaged in an active text conversation with a woman named Courtney Morris, whom he had encountered on the internet. The conversation was held over Facebook Messenger. At 9.44 a.m., Christopher attempted contacting Courtney over a call, but she didn't respond. It's been rumored that Christopher was often unfaithful to Courtney Bell, and it wasn't something new for her to confront the women Christopher was romantically involved with. To clarify, there are two individuals named Courtney in this narrative, but we will only be discussing Courtney Morris for now. Christopher, the father of her kids, joined Courtney on a nearby couch for a brief nap not long after 10 a.m. Their two-year-old daughter Clarissa startled them from sleep with the news that Kalia, presumably another family member, was missing. Their sleeping quarters were located near two exit doors, which also served as the only point of entry to the residence. In her growing worry for Kalia, Courtney dialed her father, her aunt, and friend Melissa Davis to check if Kalia might be in their care. Before long, Melissa arrived at the couple's residence only to see Christopher anxiously waiting on the porch. Melissa mentioned that he kept saying, they're going to think I did this. She urged him to relax, yet there was an unsettling feeling in the air. Courtney's voice echoed, searching for Kalia as she shared her suspicion with Melissa that perhaps Kalia had been taken by her grandparents. At 10.39 in the morning, Courtney made the decision to alert the authorities, placing a call to 911 to report Kalia's disappearance. Meanwhile, Melissa observed Christopher departing the residence, and she specifically remarked that he left empty-handed. I just woke up. My dog woke me up on the couch. Um, I have a two-year-old and I have a two-week-old. And my, my two-week-old is not in her sleeper. Her pack is on the floor. She's not in her sleeper. I, she's not in her sleeper. She, she, she's not here. I've looked everywhere. I've looked under clothes and everything. What's your address name? 12145, Highway 36, Are Lot 31. Yes, Lot 31. Do you think somebody took her, ma'am? My child said, my, my, my two-year-old says she's gone. And, and I've looked everywhere in the house, so I don't, I don't know another possibility. A number of officers quickly descended upon the location and consulted with the mother. She relayed to the law enforcement personnel her daughter Kalia's disappearance, mentioning she last spotted her around 5 a.m. It was also brought to their attention that Christopher had mentioned a text from his father at 9.30 a.m., indicating that the children were safe at the time. Courtney explained that shortly before 10.30 a.m., Clarissa roused both her and Christopher alarming them that Kalia was nowhere to be found. Furthermore, it was pointed out that Christopher had embarked on foot towards Highway 36 in pursuit of their little girl. It is essential to consider that Kalia is just an infant and incapable of walking away on her own, rendering Courtney's continuous calls for Kalia somewhat perplexing. There were no indications of forced entry into the house, including a window close to Kalia's bassinet in the master bedroom according to the park owner and the responding police. Additionally, neither the bedroom nor any other area of the house had any blood or other indications of trauma. Courtney insisted in her testimony that she had no suspicions that someone would break into the house and steal Kalia, according to one of the officers, 
an investigator investigating the crime scene observed that it did not seem likely that someone had broken in and taken Kalia since there were no indications of forced entry on the home's windows or doors. Christopher approached the residence from the direction of Highway 36 around 30 minutes after the police arrived. He was sweaty, damp, filthy, and had green material on him that suggested he might be emerging from the woods, according to witnesses who saw him at the location. It was also raining at the time. He had an exceedingly uneasy, sneaky, and fidgety demeanor. Christopher never gave an explanation for his search for Kalia in the woods, even though he did show one of the cops where he had been seeking. An officer observed that Christopher possessed a flashlight, which he said was used to search for his daughter. However, the officers on duty mentioned that the sun had risen at around 7.40 a.m. That day, shortly after, investigator Jeff Alexander reached the location and talked to the parents in their trailer. He then initiated a search for Kalia in the forested area, where Christopher reported having looked for her. Jeff found it peculiar that Christopher had chosen to search for her in that location. Furthermore, he mentioned that the sheriff's office would not have concentrated their search efforts in that area if they had not learned that the Christopher had been there. Additionally, investigator Wade Freeman, who played a role in the investigation, discovered various hypotheses about Kalia's whereabouts. These included the possibility that Christopher's father, Courtney's grandparents, or a neighbor in the trailer park could have taken her. Freeman's investigation revealed no promising leads. Greg Weatherford, the individual who shared drugs with the couple the night before, vehemently denied his involvement in the burglary of the couple's house and Kalia's subsequent kidnapping. Tim, Courtney's father, also refuted claims of being at the trailer park, either on the night of October 6th or the morning of October 7th. He insisted that he would have sought permission before taking Kalia. The Newton County Sheriff's Office brought in Christopher and Courtney for a session of questioning. Christopher received Miranda rights prior to his interview. As clarified by investigator Alexander, neither Christopher nor Courtney were considered under arrest. The interviews aimed at swiftly collating information about Kalia's vanishing timeline. According to Alexander, at that point, they were just treated as potential leads. During the interview, Christopher spoke about events from the earlier part of the week that involved his kids, Courtney's father, Tim, and the time he dedicated to taking care of and feeding Kalia. He also shared details about his connection with Courtney's family, to whom he is closely related as a first cousin. Christopher disclosed to investigator Alexander that he had taken care of feeding Kalia between 3.30 a.m. and 5 a.m. on October 7th before going back to bed. He recalled waking at around 9.30 a.m. after receiving a text message from his father, noting that both children were sleeping in the bedroom at that moment. Later, he was roused from sleep again by his elder daughter Clarissa's cries, only to find that Kalia was missing from the house. Upon searching the residence with Courtney and not finding her, he proceeded to look for Kalia in the nearby woods. Furthermore, Christopher shared his suspicions about a man named Matt Lester potentially seeking vengeance against him. On September 13th, just 10 days before Kalia's birth, Shane Kidd and Matt Lester visited the couple's trailer to discuss playing video games and engaging in drug use. Matt testified that during his visit, Christopher and another man assaulted him with punches and kicks. Matt Lester managed to escape and leave the house. When questioned, Matt testified that he never trespassed into the couple's trailer and didn't visit them after the incident with Christopher. Shane Kidd testified that Christopher didn't have any adversaries who would break into his home and abduct his newborn child. Investigator Alexander claimed that Christopher's timeline in particular, his claims that Kalia was well at 9.30 and then gone by 10.30 made it impossible for Matt Lester to have broken into the house and taken Kalia. Investigator Alexander thought it nonsensical that someone would take revenge on someone for their newborn. While that person was sound asleep on a couch close by, despite Christopher's claims to the police that he suspected someone had put out a hit on him. It should be mentioned that Matt Lester was incarcerated during this period and that he had just died as a result of stealing a truck and crashing it while he was on parole. Tim Bell was immediately ruled out as a suspect according to investigator Alexander, and there was no proof that Christopher or Courtney possessed any substantial assets that would have made them the subject of a ransom demand. 
Investigator Alexander stated in court that he was unable to reconcile Christopher's claims regarding the duration of his relationship with Kalia since her birth with the information he had obtained regarding the father's limited time with his own daughter and the amount of time Kalia had spent with other family members. Christopher did not inquire about the search for his daughter at the time of the interview. After the questioning, deputies took Christopher and Courtney home without filing any charges. That afternoon and evening, Kalia's whereabouts were still under investigation. K-9 units were dispatched to the trailer park and a perimeter was established around the wooded area. After allowing the dogs to smell a portion of Kalia's clothing, they made an effort to locate her by following a path through the woods, crossing Henderson Mill Road and entering an area where logging had been done. During the search, the dogs were unable to find Kalia. The search was called off for the evening at about nine o'clock that evening. Christopher and Courtney, along with Pamela Hamby, were ready to go on TV for a news conference early on October 8. As you may remember from before, Pamela is Christopher's aunt and Courtney's birth mother. The search for Kalia had picked back up during this period. A neighbor who had joined the hunt saw something strange and out of the ordinary, a piece of wood resting over a hole in the ground. There was a pile of sticks underneath the log. When the neighbor tugged on the black drawstring, she discovered a blue Nike drawstring bag. The neighbor then requested that someone accompany her and call the police. While taking part in the search in the vicinity of Henderson Mill Road, Deputy Timothy Dickerson responded to the location of the bag. Although the bag seemed damp from the recent rain, Deputy Dickerson did not believe it had been there for very long. Shortly after his arrival at the crime scene, investigator Mickey Kitchens, accompanied by Deputy Dickerson, examined the contents of a discovered bag. Inside, they unearthed several items of male attire later identified as Christopher McNabb's. As they continued their search, they glimpsed the crown of a baby's head concealed beneath a blanket at the bag's base, the deceased infant Kalia McNabb. Close to this tragically sobering discovery was an assortment of drug. The presence of Kalia's remains near the home raised questions about why the canine unit couldn't detect her scent. The combination of her small stature, the manner in which she was transported, and her being swaddled in clothes within the confines of the bag are believed to have obscured her scent from the search dogs. The news of the grim discovery reached Kim Weatherford Courtney's aunt and Craig's mother through her husband, prompting her to immediately inform her niece about the heartbreaking incident. During the incident, Courtney was traveling with her mother, Pamela, Christopher, and two additional passengers. They were en route to their trailer for a press interview when they received news that Kalia had been located. Upon hearing this, Kim informed Courtney, after which Pamela urged Christopher to make a quick exit from the vehicle. Pamela, who was both Courtney's mother and Christopher's aunt, admitted in court that she instructed Christopher to leave out of concern that he would be suspected of being involved in Kalia's disappearance. Christopher himself expressed fears about being implicated, especially if Kalia was found near where they lived. It was at a traffic stop as the light turned red when Christopher blurted out his apprehension about being wrongly accused, prompting him to abruptly exit the vehicle. In the following minutes, Courtney, Pam, and others reached the trailer park, even though Christopher was not with them. A conversation between Courtney and an official unfolded, which centered around a missing backpack. When asked about it, Courtney mentioned a bag Christopher had, which she hadn't spotted recently. She described the bag's unique features as those of a Nike drawstring bag. On one side, it was blue with a red logo, while the reverse side was red with a blue logo. According to her, the bag was perpetually with Christopher as he used it to carry his clothes. However, she failed to spot it in the recent few days. The situation took an interesting turn when Courtney disclosed a piece of crucial news to the officer. She explained that after hearing about Kalia's discovery, Christopher's bewildering reaction was to suddenly exit the car and dash away, declaring they were going to implicate me in this. The officer subsequently initiated a search for the father Investigator Alexander, who led the pursuit for Kalia and now Christopher, observed that this heightened their suspicions because, as they put it, innocent individuals do not flee. Later that day, Christopher arrived at a Chevron gas station on Highway 36. Cashier Julie Hanna claimed that Christopher appeared wet and unkempt. He informed her that he had exited the vehicle upon discovering Kalia had been located and was running due to police pursuing him. 
Christopher, exhibiting hyperactivity, asserted to the cashier that he was not responsible. The cashier dialed 911 and requested not to be left alone with Christopher. A customer stated that Christopher claimed to have spent two days in the woods, but this was not the sole 911 call made. In total, there were three calls. Upon receiving the emergency call, the officer made his way to Christopher's location, near a gas station, and apprehended him. At the point of capture, Christopher's attire was damp and littered with grass and leaves, indicative of time spent in a forested region. After his incarceration, Christopher received a reiteration of his Miranda rights before an interrogative session was held. During the interview, Christopher relayed Kim Weatherford's phone exchange with Courtney in which Kalia's discovery was reported. He explained that Kim had consistently pointed the finger at him, suggesting he had harmed Kalia, which led to his fearful departure from the car and refusal to return to the trailer. Christopher also confessed to drug use in the evening preceding Kalia's disappearance. However, he categorically denied having used his Facebook after checking in on his children at 9.30 a.m. The following day, the medical examiner conducted Kalia's autopsy. Kalia had a gray adult t-shirt with no sleeves wrapped around her torso under a blue blanket. There were leaves and other debris within the sack in which she had been found, as well as between her body and the t-shirt, and there were blood-like streaks on the blanket. Kalia had several injuries to her face and head, and multiple fractures, an indentation in her skull, and serious brain damage, according to the medical examiner, because these wounds were closed head traumas. There were possibly with a sharp object just below her eye. Additionally, Kalia sustained injuries to her mouth, allowing her deciduous teeth to pierce her gums. The head injury that most likely caused all of the fractures and oral injuries to Kalia was the cause of these injuries, according to the medical examiner's testimony. It's possible that Kalia's mouth and cheek injuries caused the bleeding shown on the blanket. Deciduous teeth are your baby teeth. For those of you who don't know, Kalia had just been born. While every infant is unique, the onset of baby teeth often occurs around the six month mark. This indicates that Kalia was severely her baby teeth, which were still positioned high in her skull, passed through her gums and lacerated her cheeks. Her age was only 15 days. Kalia would have died quite rapidly, according to the medical examiner, who also found that all of her injuries occurred at once. According to her testimony, the injuries could have resulted from a succession of to the head of her from a crushing injury, from stomping on a hard surface or having a big object fall on her head. Kalia may have fallen asleep on the bed, but the medical examiner ruled out the likelihood that a television or other heavy object would have hit her. The soft bed, she pointed out, would have protected Kalia's head from the impact of the falling object, and these kinds of injuries were more prevalent when a crushing hit left the head pressed firmly against a hard surface. Additionally, she stated that Kalia's body had leaves on it, which could mean that Kalia was wearing the clothing while in the forested area. Kalia was a victim of her cause of death was a hard blow to the head. Attending the autopsy, investigator Alexander stated that, in his opinion, Kalia's death was most definitely not an accident. Christopher faced charges of criminal homicide, aggravated violence, concealing a death. October 11, 2017. According to his arrest warrants, Christopher said, did strike the victim with an unknown object. This action did cause the victim's to be seriously figured and damaged beyond repair. Christopher requested to speak with investigator Alexander on December 13, 2017. He was led into an interrogation room and had his Miranda rights read. He claimed that Shane Kidd, Kalia, in the interview. In addition, he blamed Kalia's demise on his meth use and the drug users he let stay in his house. He also acknowledged in the same interview that he had given Courtney a black after striking her a week or two before Kalia was born. Investigator Alexander investigated further leads and hearsay regarding the crime that was going on in the neighborhood, including the claim that Shane Kidd was responsible for Kalia's death. All of those allegations, he discovered, were untrue, and he had not come across anyone who would kidnap or murder infant Kalia. Courtney was also taken into custody shortly after for her part in Kalia's demise on January 1st, 2018, 
Despite the fact that the courts concluded Christopher was the one who killed Kalia, Courtney was irresponsible in creating the murder because of her extensive drug use and her actions also played a role in the death of her infant daughter. In the words of District Attorney Leela Zahn about Kalia, she said she was a gift to Courtney Bell and Christopher McNabb. That child was doomed the moment they left that hospital. They took pure innocence and brought that child into a life of hell. Concerning Christopher, she further commented, all this fake crying and fake tears he did during the interviews about how much he loved his children and that he did it in the courtroom are a joke. Christopher has been convicted on multiple counts, including malice murder, felony murder, second degree murder, aggravated assault, first degree cruelty to children, second degree cruelty to children, and hiding another person's death. He is currently confined to Hayes State Prison serving a life term with no chance for parole. Upon hearing his sentence, Christopher maintained his innocence, exclaiming, I would never do this. I'm innocent. You claim you're innocent, so you tell me what sentence the man or woman that you claim did this should receive. If you ever find out who did them, they deserve to be under the jail. Okay, so they ought to get the maximum sentence. Most definitely. Okay. On the crime of malice murder, I sentence you to life in confinement without parole. On considering the death of another, I sentence you to 10 years of confinement consecutive or after. Count one. You understand each of your sentences? Courtney was found guilty of homicide of the second degree, cruelty to a minor in the second degree, and contributing to a minor's dependency. During the sentencing, she admitted that her addiction to substances was an illness and said, I try to be a good mama. I love my babies. Nonetheless, Judge John Ott offered a rebuttal to her claim, stating, And you chose the amphetamine and McNabb over a baby. It's a sickness, but I tried to be a good mama. The I love my babies. The problem, Miss McNabb, is that, like most criminals, you have this version of what a good mama is that is so far from the norm that, you know, you go anywhere in this county, talk to anybody who's watching this and say, is it a good mama who doesn't even care about her 14-year-old baby? Put them with a the cousin. I've known of instances where mamas won't even live in the first couple of weeks of a child's life. People around the child for fear that the child's immune system hadn't been built up and they don't want germs brought into the child. They go to that extent. You went just the exact opposite direction. And there's just no excuse for that. On count, well, let's talk about this. Count two merges with count one. Yes, Judge. What's the talk, thought about count three? On count one, I'm gonna sentence you with 30 years with the first 15 years to be served in confinement in the state penitentiary the main time on probation. On count three, I'm gonna sentence you to 10 years in confinement in the run at the same time as count one. Now, do you understand your two sentences? Let the record reflect she's nodding her head slightly yes. So has justice found its way finally. The answer would vary based on who you're asking. Courtney Bell's homicide convictions have been overruled by the Georgia Court of Appeals. They argued that the presented evidence did not sufficiently justify a jury's verdict of guilt on charges of second degree homicide and cruelty to a minor of the second degree. However, the judicial trio did confirm Courtney's conviction for the felony charge of aiding and abetting minor dependency. She is currently held captive in Pulaski State Prison and it is indicated that the earliest she can be released is January 5th, 2030. Parole, though, is a possibility for her. Interestingly, Courtney has positioned a profile on a prison-oriented dating website called cagedladies.com. The content of her advertisement is specified below. Hey there, my name is Courtney Bell. I'm 29 years old, 5 foot 5 and 180 pounds, with long hair down to my waist and beautiful blue eyes. I'm a down-to-earth, lovable, spur-of-the-moment type of woman who's also open to all genders and enjoys surprises to keep things on the edge. I've been in prison for five years now, but was recently granted an appeal, 
so I'm hopeful I'll be given an early release date soon so I can return home and start living my life again, but with more intention. In the meantime, I'm in search of that special someone who'd like to become a friend and companion to me while I finish out these trying times. And hopefully we can bring each other some happiness and excitement along the way. I'm definitely in search of comfort and understanding from someone compassionate enough towards my situation and eager to pursue the possibilities of the future that's ahead, but not known yet. What are your thoughts on this situation? As with many aspects of this case, there is a lot to analyze and numerous unresolved questions. The true crime community has proposed several theories about Courtney, such as her being fully aware of Christopher's intentions towards Kalia, or even the possibility that she orchestrated the entire event. Is Courtney entirely accountable for the events leading to her daughter's death? It's important to note that Courtney is a victim of domestic violence. Evidence of this can be seen in the police body cam footage where she appears bruised. Additionally, multiple reports confirm that Christopher assaulted her, an act he openly admitted to during his court hearing. Some individuals have suggested that a drug treatment facility could be a more suitable environment for Courtney to recover and acquire the necessary skills to contribute positively to society upon her release in 2030. Do you concur with this perspective or do you believe that Courtney was fed up with the abuse, infidelity, and potentially framed Christopher? Share your opinions in the comments section below.